find other great podcasts like this one at podmoth.network. Do you love unraveling a good old-fashioned whodunit? Oh honey, me too. I'm Alicia, armchair detective and host of Dead On, a true crime podcast. Join me every Friday. We'll dive into a case that scratches your itch for true crime, dark history, and mystery. Streaming now, everywhere you love to listen. What's up, you guys? I'm Catherine. And I'm Haley. And we are Saturdays for the Ghouls. A Podmouth podcast. And it's, been a, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Spooky babes. By the way, how are you? How you doing? Guess what? It's our 100th official episode. Technically speaking, we hit 100 like 20 episodes ago because of our bonus episodes and like other content that we posted. But official episodes, it's our 100th episode. Anyway, so our 100th episode is a crime thriller movie. Now, we all know where this crime thriller movie came from. If you watched our last episode, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So AI helped choose our movie for this week. And to be honest, AI chose a movie that I would have never chose myself. To be honest. and. Along with my research, not only are we doing a crime thriller, it's also an adaptation from a book, and there's a little mini super short true crime case that I'm going to talk about. So it's like legitimately hitting all all the things. You're getting all in one. Yeah, you guys are really lucky right now. So how are you been doing? How's life? Life updates? What else? I mean, I'm just going to say I'm the reason. It's all my fault that y'all didn't get an episode last week. On the bright side, we completely crushed cleaning an entire four-bedroom, two-bath house in nine hours. Well, you know, life's hectic. We're going to power through it. Work is work, but it's fine. Work sucks. I know. Work sucks. We know. Anyway. I, ha- I have missed you. How have you I been? missed you. Been good. It's been very hot here. It's really hot here and I don't have an AC in my car. And so I have to spend an exorbitant amount of money to fix my AC. I was just going to get a new car, but I don't really want to. So I'm just going to fix my car. Oops. If I haven't said it yet, it's over 100 episodes. And we're going to do a crime thriller called gone girl so Haley, do you want to do a Haley synopsis or would you like the mini synopsis first i'll go first one two three go i was gonna be like daredevil no wrong <laughs> it's been affleck okay but he's not a daredevil in the movie i know but he he's plays not daredevil. yes but he's not daredevil in the movie so we got affleck and we got rosamund pike Rosamund Pike. Rosamund Pike, yes. Rosamund Pike. Okay, got man and woman. Man and woman. Yeah. Yeah. They got man and woman. They fall in love. They go on some like weird sexual treasure hunts all the time. So 50 Shades of Grey mixed Not at all. No. Okay, fine. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Whatever, whatever. All right. Man and woman fall in love man cheats on said wife with younger college student was his student very sleazy has a twin sister named margo best character oh i only i only remember her name i can't remember anyone else's name amy nick nick yes so margo best character honestly true you know it's your anniversary you know, talking to and confiding in his sister, who's also his business partner. I want a divorce. Like, she's basically crazy. Comes back, she's gone. 
house looks destroyed. So he's like, I think she's missing. He's kind of acting a little weird, like almost relieved to a point, which honestly, I don't blame him. So then an investigation happens and he comes under fire that maybe he murdered her. And us as a viewer is like, oh shit, did he actually murder her? Like what happened? Because he's not helping his case because he's very being very suspicious. Even his sister doesn't even know. And then you got Tyler Perry in there and he's representing the man. And uh, yeah, I don't remember that guy's name either. I just know they Tanner. called him Elvis. Tanner. Tanner. Yeah. I just know they called him Elvis. <clears throat> but yeah. So basically the whole movie is this man trying to redeem himself. And is she dead? Is she not dead? Did he have something to do with it? Did he not have something to do with it? Is she really gone? Like, is she, is it all just one big anniversary treasure hunt? Find out on this episode of Saturdays for the Ghouls. <laughs> exactly. And it's, a, it's like, gone, gone, cheat, sex, sex, robot dog. I love the robot dog. More lies, more deception, twist, twist, theft, evidence, robot cat, murder. <laughs> champagne bottle this woman Um, this woman is psycho she's unhinged unhinged crazy crazy and they all live happily ever after plus one (laughs) well thank you for that lovely description that told them absolutely fucking nothing i'm now going to spoil the movie for you okay this movie this movie okay on the day that we watched the movie i also read the entire book (laughs) And she would not tell me. I was like, oh, I wonder how much different the movie is from the book. Because I also own the book. I just haven't read it. And she was like, hmm, I wonder. And I was like, I see. You're saving it for the pod. She's like, yep. <laughs> I have a whole section about the differences between the book and the movie. And we have a whole section about the book. But right now we're going to talk about the movie. So just to let you know, the movie is like, Hella twisty, hella turny, right? And so if you don't want to be spoiled, you probably should go watch it before you listen to the rest of this podcast. Because, like always, I always will spoil it. And especially in this case, because we're going to go deep dive into the book and the movie. If you've seen the movie and you'd like to read the book, I guess you could go read the book. But that's going to take you a while, I'm pretty sure. The audiobook itself is 20 hours. So, yes. This movie was directed by David Fincher, and it was written by Gillian Flynn, who also wrote the book. It's very cool that she got to write the actual screenplay for the movie of her book. That doesn't always happen, that Mm -hmm. the author gets to to write the screenplay. She's got some good agents. So here is the mini IMDb synopsis that tells you also absolutely nothing, but maybe a little more sense than Haley's scenario. With his wife's disappearance having become the focus of an intense media circus, a man sees the spotlight turned on him when it's suspected that he may not be innocent. So this movie stars a few people and Ben Affleck as Nick. I hate Ben Affleck. I have a very high hatred for Ben Affleck. He's awful and terrible, and I don't really like movies with him in it. So that already gets a negative point for this movie compared to the book okay great why don't you like him catherine what could possibly be wrong with ben affleck okay so here's here's the truth of the matter ben affleck has personally never done anything to to make me hate it he gives me the ick every time i see the man and and okay i know that these are not justified reasons to hate someone but here's the other thing is that he has spent a lot of time in Hollywood with people who are not the savoriest of people, if you know what I mean. So none of his scandals that he has had in the past, however long of his career, can ever seem to stick to Ben Affleck. He always seems to be fine when other people who get like scandals for something minor, then they like have to carry that for the rest of their lives. But him his scandals never stick to him he's a cheater and he's 
like just skeezy to me. I just don't like him. There's nothing that anyone can say about Ben Affleck that will make me like the man. That's fair. He's also a man. <laughs> He's not one of the girls the gays of the days. So I'm not quite interested, you know? I think he was married to the lady that did play Electra, and I think he did cheat on her. I'm not lying. Who did who played Electra? Okay, here's the thing. I have a soft spot for both of them because I grew up on the movie Daredevil. I know people hate that movie because it's a horrible adaptation of Daredevil, but that shit in my my prepubescent years. Mm. 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 Switching sides. Switching sides. That one. It had it had fuck the bullseye guy, bro. I forgot his name. It's like call wait, no. Is it called for I mean that's a that's an actor. I don't know if that's the right person. I think it is, but I thought Electra was so hot. I wanted to be her. <laughs> There's no nostalgic reason for me to like Ben Affleck. There's nothing that I I just hate him. So that's all. Colin Barrel. That was close. That also popped in my head, but I thought it was the other guy, which is probably who called Colin Firth. Colin Firth? See, that's why I was confused when you said Colin Firth, because he's not... That's that's <laughs> Mr. Gatsby, right? Or not not Gatsby, I'm sorry. I mean, Mr. Darcy. Now we're too fucking stupid to talk about movies. <laughs> Let's reel it back to Ben Affleck. I'm sorry that you have a nostalgic reason to like Ben Affleck. I still don't like him. I'm so done with myself right now. <laughs> I, I literally, literally was thinking the movie Pride and Prejudice, but for some reason Gatsby came out. Okay, Ben Affleck. So he plays Nick, and then Amy is our female main character, and she is played by Rosamund Pike. I don't know anything she's in, but she's in this movie. Then we have Margot played by Carrie Coon, and we have Detective Rhonda Boney played by kim dickens we have andy is played by emily ratajkowski which doesn't mean anything to you right now but it will later and then tanner bolt he plays a lawyer he's played by tyler perry and desi collins is played by neil patrick harris one thing about the characters compared to the book is that almost none of them except for maybe Margot and maybe amy looked how i expected them to look Ben Affleck was not the person in my brain when I was thinking of Nick when I was reading the book. Okay. So that's another thing about the movie that's like, I don't know. I felt like casting wasn't that great for the man, but it doesn't matter. That's fine. I didn't look at the casting before we watched the movie. So when it was, when we turned on the movie, I, I looked at Haley and I was like, says Ben Affleck in it? She goes, yeah. <laughs> Was You're like, like oh ah. but it helped me hate nick you know so bong girl released at the 52nd new york film festival and had a nationwide release in north america in 3014 theaters on october 3rd 2014 the book was released in 2012 this movie won 64 awards and was nominated for 188 this movie is a very highly spoken of movie it's a lot of people like it. Today, Haley, you're on The Price is Right. You want to talk about the budget with me? Sure. <laughs> no. Haley, come on down. Come on down, Haley. <laughs> Haley, Sorry. what do you think the budget was for Gone Girl from 2014? 20 million. No. Sorry. Is it more or less? It is more. Would you like to take another guess? Is it triple digits? No. Well, okay. I mean... It's more than triple digits if you think about it, but no, it's not triple digits in the millions. That's what I meant. Yeah, I know. 70. Oh, Max Close? Kind of. 80. 60. Or 61. Oh! Million. Well, okay, it's 71 popped in my head. Uh, yeah, exactly. When you said 70, I was like, whoa, you're within 9 million, which is kind of close. You know, so. Okay, so. What do you think this movie made? Knowing that it's a very high awards, people seem to really like it. And what do you think it made? It at least made its money back. I'm going to tell you that. Oh, okay. Because I was like, 
honestly, because I feel like it wasn't like well advertised. Because I don't remember this movie like coming out. I think I watched it at home when it like first came out. But anyway, I'm gonna say two hundred million. No, would you like to take another guess? More or less. More. Oh, oh my god, a lot more. Yeah, I say a lot more. Okay, there's a few numbers in my head right now. Okay, channel me. Okay, so you say a lot more, though. So in my brain, okay, I, I'm not going to lie. So the first number popped in my head was 500. Less. Okay, so it's 300? No. <laughs> no? I mean, it's not exactly 300, but it is 300. within the 300. It's within the 300 million realm. So you have basically 100 million to work with here. What do you think it is? It's three hundred and sixty-five million dollars. Three hundred and sixty-nine, which is very, very close. Bro. So three hundred and sixty-nine million dollars is what it made grossly worldwide. That's crazy. So that means even in other places, other countries. The the first if I go with just what it made in the US and Canada, it made closer to two hundred though, which is one hundred and sixty seven million. So if you're talking about just U.S. and Canada, I guess 200 would have fit. Outside of North America, it earned 24.6 million from 5,270 screens that it was on in 39 international markets on its opening weekend. So in the U.K., they made 6.7 million. In Australia, they made 4.6 million. In France, they made 3.65 million. Russia, they made three point four million, and Germany, they play, made two point six million. That's a lot of money internationally that they made. That mm-hmm. I feel like other movies that we've covered don't make in; mm-hmm. they don't even get released internationally. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. So, this movie was a money maker, for sure. Do you want to talk about some fun facts? Yes. Fun facts we can do 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 do. Okay, so. The bar, which is owned by Margot and Nick in the movie, is a real bar that is in Missouri called The Bar. Whoa. Fun, right? That's fun. Okay. Here's a reason if you would like to try to hate Ben Affleck more. Production was halted during the movie because Ben Affleck refused to wear a Yankees hat when they were filming because... Nick was supposed to wear a hat and they would give him a Yankees hat and he was like I'm not wearing a Yankees hat because I don't know sports or something like you know rituals so basically they had to halt production while him and David argued about what hat he'd have to wear so that's nice bro what a fucking prima donna Jesus, just wear the fucking hat your baseball team's gonna do bad anyway so I think he wore like a Red Sox hat or something but in the end so when they were trying to cast Tanner Bolt, who is Tanner Bolt in the movie and the book, he is a a lawyer who commonly defends men who are on trial for killing their wives. They may or may not be guilty, but he is great at getting them out of whatever sticky situation they're in, right? So originally they were looking for someone who was an Alec Baldwin type instead of who they casted, which was Tyler Perry. I think that Alec Baldwin type would have been more realistic than Tyler Perry because he kind of was more comedic with it, you know? Mm -hmm. But he's Tyler Perry, so he's obviously going to be a little comedic with it, you know? And Tyler Perry actually said that he would not have accepted the role if he knew that this movie was about a book. But he said that his agent specifically didn't tell him that because he knew that his agent knew that he wouldn't have selected it because he doesn't he didn't want to be in a movie with a book because people who you know when they have adaptations people love the book so much and they want the movie to be something specific and he didn't want to be a part of like something that let them down you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah, yeah so he he would he never would have wanted to do a book movie a book to movie adaptation and his his agent knew that but he signed on and then he found out that it was actually a book fire and then he was he had already signed in so he couldn't get out but would you like to know who else they might have casted as amy dunn who was the main female character yes 
Mimi Dunn in the book is described as a size two cool girl. You know, she's, you know, for the most part until after they got married, she was, you know, one of the girls that he like that guys just wanted to be around. She could eat hot dogs and stay a size two, like all that stuff. She was blonde, pretty, blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the women that potentially were going to be Amy Dunn was Reese Witherspoon, Emily Blunt, Rooney Mara, Olivia Wilde, Abby Cornish, Jessica Chasting, and Juliana Hugh. They were all considered at one point for the role before Rosamund Pike was selected. Reese Witherspoon, though, originally got the rights to make the book into a movie, and she was going to be Amy, but after discussing it with David, apparently she was like, she realized she was probably not the right fit. So she is a producer. I think, I think Rooney Mara would have been good. Mm hmm I think that, I, yeah, that Reese could have done it. I don't think that she was so far-fetched, but, you know, I don't think that David wanted her to do it. You know, we're just guessing, but, you know. Yeah, see, my thing is, I feel like, I'm not saying Rosemary Pike isn't well-known, but I'm saying, like, it's going to sound bad either way. She's not, like, if you see her, you're like, oh, right. That's, that, like, if you saw Reese Witherspoon, you'd think Elle Woods. Right, right. It might have actually been a good thing because it was easier to put her in the box of Amy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know Rosamund Pike much. I mean, at all before this movie. Speaking of Rosamund Pike, she gained and lost 13 pounds for the movie because when she disappeared, plot mm -hmm. twist, <laughs> when she disappeared, she was heavier. So she like would eat like burgers and something oh malt beverages you know like milkshakes mm -hmm. and then she had to like exercise extremely hard to get it off i also read somewhere that potentially she might have had to gain the 13 pounds like four times back and forth and i'm like that doesn't seem that doesn't seem very healthy <laughs> no that seems like that is a very awful concoction for an eating disorder yeah but maybe if you only have to do it four times for a movie, it won't catch on. Rosemary but... Pike. Rosemary Pike. How are, are you, you okay, Rosemary Pike? Oh, I hope you're okay. I'm sure she's okay. Now, Nick was cheating on Amy with Andy. Andy was playing a 20-year-old college student. And, you know, Nick was like in his late 30s. And it was her teacher. Yes. Talk about abuse of power. Now... Did did this girl seem familiar to you at all, Haley? Am I an asshole if I say no? I didn't know it until I read this. I mean, I guess she had one of those like faces, but I don't know. I I couldn't like, pinpoint her. So Emily was casted by recommendation of Ben Affleck, and Ben Affleck told David to go watch her infamous appearance on Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines music video. Where she's dancing fully naked. That slow sleazy. I know. That that is that's so slimy. That is I was like, oh, are you Nick in real life? Like, why is she doing that? Like, he was like, go watch the music video. You're gonna want her for Andy. Ew. Oh, so Ew. He, he literally he literally was like, damn, she's hot. I have to fuck this girl in this game. Yeah. Get her. Yeah, right? So I mean, obviously, we don't know that that's exactly what went down, but that's what was, that was what was on IMDb, and IMDb never lied. <laughs> Let's bring it back to someone not as gross, but kind of was gross in the movie, Neil Patrick Harris. Neil Patrick Harris played Desi, and Desi used to stalk Amy. Well, did he stalk Amy? We don't actually know, because Amy's so fucking unhinged. <laughs> but he used to like stalk Amy and like almost committed suicide over her and like all of this stuff. But he told Out Magazine when the movie was released that the sex scene between him and Amy, where here's a spoiler, he gets deaded. That was extremely choreographed and that he had to rehearse the sex scene with her, with Rosamond 
and David in the room. And it's like every inch of it was choreographed. He quoted it in the article and it says, he said, then put your mouth on his dick here and then this many number of thrusts and then you ejaculate. He goes, it was really weird and technically broken down sex scene. He wanted it to be almost robotic that we know exactly where we are position wise and where everything goes. Supposedly, they practiced that sex scene for like two hours, like just them alone. Like they had to practice it like in their undies. And, you know, Rosamund Pike was married and she's like, this is fucking weird to do this like weird grinding like thing with some other man who's also married and like, they're just like i don't know it's oh. that that seems like the worst like having to do a sex scene that's like choreographed so like the fact of like grinding on somebody for a movie like in front of like a bunch of cameras and like right. for what <laughs> for what for the perfect death scene yeah so also Rosamund Pike supposedly used a Dora the Explorer doll to practice her sex scene when she was not with Neil Tracaris. Oh, that's even weirder. Why would she publicly say this? I don't know why she would ever admit that. Exactly. Maybe that was just made up. It was on the internet. So I just just to forewarn everyone, everything I could say could be made up. It's on the internet. But I do my research. I try. <laughs> okay. So this was um, Julian Flynn's first movie adaptation. And then basically all her books become shows or movies. She has Shark Objects, uh, Gone Girl, uh, Dark Places, and Widows. Those are all of I, her. I think I've heard of Sharp Objects. Sharp Objects is a show. I think it's on HBO. Yeah, I think I've seen that in passing. Now, I don't know if Widows is a book adaptation i've never heard of that book but it is on her it's a, a neo nor heist thriller film screenplay oh she's it's her screenplay i don't know i don't think it's a book but it does look like a screenplay by jillian flynn but for sure gone girl sharp little sharp objects and dark places are all books that were put into movies or shows so she knows how to make nice. some money so i know we got to see who might play Ro amy other than rosamund pike would you like to know who else was considered for nick yes okay some of these are going to shock you i know so i'm going to get the two out of the way that will not shock you which is tom cruise and brad pitt because ben affleck and his, all of those three are kind of like yeah they're always the same character you know now the, the one that's kind of weird and out there is seth rogan i do not think that he would not have been good as it would have been too funny. Yeah. Now, someone that I think would have been excellent for the role and that I thoroughly enjoy was Ryan Reynolds. He could have totally played Nick. He literally popped in my head. Now, if 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 he was playing Nick, I would have been like, okay, that's exactly the kind of person I saw Nick when I was reading the book. When I like in my head, it was kind of like a Ryan Reynolds esque type of guy. You know, charming in the beginning. Because you know Ryan Reynolds can be charming, all that stuff. Um, and then the last guy, and I, the last guy is John Hamm from Mad Men. And the only reason that he did not get the part over Ben Affleck is that the director or the producer of Mad Men wouldn't adjust his schedule for him to work on the movie. He legitimately almost had the part, and they had to recast him because he wasn't he was his schedule would not allow. Another fun fact, which this is so minuscule, but I think it's so interesting when this song plays in movies. So when Nick Dunn was driving his father back to the retirement home, the song in the car was Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult. That song plays in many other movies like Halloween, when Annie is driving with Lori. There's a cover version in The Scream when... Billy comes to the window of Sydney's bedroom playing, and it's also the opening credits of The Stand movie. Oh, Stephen King. Oh. <laughs> a lot of horror movies use that, that song. And we'll get into his dad. His dad did not play a big part in the movie, but he played a bigger part in the book. So that Don't Fear the Reaper makes more sense when you've already read the book. 
when you're talking about the dad. And we'll get to that later. Now, do you want to know what Ben did to just like get into the mood of being a man convicted of murdering his spouse? No. You don't? Okay, we'll move right along. That was my mini true crime. No, no, no. You can go. You can go. So Ben Affleck studied men who were also convicted of murdering their spouses. That's not that's not that big of a deal, right? But specifically, he did he did study one man in particular, and that is Scott Peterson from the Lacey Peterson case. It was a big case. So here is the mini IMDb short true crime for Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson was convicted of first degree murder with special circumstances in the death of his wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. On November 12th of 2004, despite the lack of any direct physical evidence connecting him to the crime, Lacey went missing on Christmas Eve 2002 while Scott said he was fishing. The case soon gripped the nation as the weeks passed. Peterson traded in the car, traded in Lacey's car, made inquiries about selling their home, actions which raised suspicion. On April 18th, three after the remains of Lacey and Connor washed up a few miles from where he was fishing, Peterson dyed his hair blonde and was arrested in San Diego. In his truck was $15,000 in cash and a survival kit. Police speculated that he was preparing to flee to Mexico, and it was later learned that Peterson was having an affair with Amber Frey and had cheated on Lacey throughout the marriage. Prosecution theorized that he murdered Lacey because he wanted to be rid of the impending responsibility of fatherhood. On March 16th, 2005, Peterson was formally sentenced to death and sent to San Quentin State Prison. And that's your true crime for your 100th episode. So that's all the like specific fun facts specific to the movie. Okay. So as we know, you and I have said it already. Gone Girl was originally a book. This book is a dual POV book where you are getting both Nick and Amy point of views throughout the book. In the beginning, Amy's point of view is from a journal that she has written before she disappeared. The big plot twist here, and you're going to have to figure that out before I tell you all of this stuff. The big plot twist here is that Amy faked her disappearance and was going to unalive herself to basically convict her husband of murder to give him the death penalty because he wronged her in some way, which was having an affair. Then she decided not to unalive herself because she thought too much of herself and she decided to just try to run away. She lost all her money and so she took her friend Desi, who was previously maybe a stalker of hers, and he put her up in his lake house and they he basically was starting to hold her hostage there but she got out of that situation by unaliving desi and she returns home as a prodigal wife in this case and she has a story for everything and she said that killing desi was self-defense and she basically holds nick as her spouse in their house for the remainder of their lives like she has things on him that she's going to you know say and make him go to jail if he decides to leave her and that's kind of the big spoiler end of like the whole movie so the book and the movie have a lot of differences that kind of i would say that they cut out of the movie so there was a lot more in the book than there was shown in the movie if that makes sense yeah and that's common it's a 20 hour audiobook and it was down to a two and a half hour movie there were a lot of lines that were direct quotes from the book because i literally wa- read the book right before i watched the movie i was like that's a direct quote it's a direct quote like i was saying that while we were watching the movie but the book was originally written in only Nick's point of view and Jillian was like I think it's going to be a disservice to not expand on Amy's character and I think that if it had only been Nick's point of view 
I think that the book would not have been as successful as it was. It would have been boring. Right. She also said that originally she was going to call this book Psycho Bitch. She changed her mind. I also think that naming the book Psycho Bitch would have not gotten her as many sales, potentially, because Mm -hmm. people would have been like, I'm not reading a book in public called Psycho Bitch. So there's that, too. But the book is very highly spoken of, but a very common complaint that I found among reviews on like Goodreads at Storygraph is that the ending feels like it falls kind of flat. So the twist happens in the middle of the story. You know, you find out Amy's not really dead and that he never killed her. And then it feels like you are kind of reading an epilogue, but it's just a very long epilogue at the end. And so it, that's why it, it kind of feels like the story falls flat. But I also felt that way with the movie. Once we found out plot twist, I felt like we were in just like trying to get through the rest of the movie. I don't know if you felt that way with the movie. I did. I So with the movie, I, like I said, I've seen it like once before. I swore that it ended differently. Like I thought that it was like more justice for Nick. But when it ended the way it did, I was like, oh, that's, that's sad. Yeah. That's disappointing. Yeah, I agree. And it just felt like it felt like it wasn't really the end. Like yeah. you'd you imagine that the end would be someone is a victor and someone is a loser. But at the end of the day, they're in the same pre- predicament they were the day before the 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 disappearance, you know? They're still together and unhappy for the mm-hmm. most part. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And they're bringing so, a child into it. Right. So I have I did some some countless research on what differences specifically were in the book and the movie. Now, I had some jotted down here, but I cannot have done this without Time Magazine and Huffington Post and all the other people who wrote articles about the differences between the book and the movie. So thank you very much, because I have a bad memory. But there were, I would say, about 20 big differences between the book and the movie. And I'm going to explain them. Probably 20. I mean... Some of the lists say like 13, some of them say like 12, some say 15. I don't know. I had I had a handful I had jotted down and there was that. So there are three-ish characters that are completely cut out of the movie from the book. In the book, there is we meet Desi's mother, who has a striking resemblance to Amy which makes Desi even a little more creepy because, you know, his mom looks like Amy and he's obsessed with Amy, which means he's kind of... Made your mama's boy. Right, he has mommy issues, you know, that kind of stuff. We also meet Tanner Bolt's wife, the lawyer, and his wife is also... who he His wife helps Nick prepare for the interview. Instead of Tanner and Margot, his wife helps him. Okay. And then we also completely lost a a character named Hillary Handy, and Hillary Handy was a high school friend from Amy that she that Amy had accused of stalking her and and like tried to and turned on her basically and and tried to ruin her life just like she was doing to Nick and just like she had done with Tommy who was her boyfriend who she said raped her so. The thing is, is that the movie is much darker about Tommy. So maybe that was to kind of like combine Hillary and Tommy into one character so they couldn't do all the things that they did in the movie. But Tommy's fate is much more grim in the movie because in the book, she dropped charges and he didn't have to register as like a sex offender. He was he was able to move on and live with his life, right? In the book, in the movie, he was basically pled guilty and had to register as a sex offender instead of going to jail so that was kind of more of a darker thing and that's what david fincher did was he made a lot of the book a little bit darker but in my opinion what he what he downplayed was how unhinged amy is now amy in the movie is unhinged but in the book amy is severely unhinged like she He's 
top of the line. And in the in the movie, I felt like she was like mid tier unhinged, just crazy, you know. So like, if you want to read a book about a legit like psycho unhinged woman, you would want to read the book. That's that's the only thing I could tell you. When Amy and Nick meet in the book, there's like an eight month gap before they start dating. And they completely cut that out of the storyline. They just like met and started dating and then they went to the party and kind of stuff together. Nick never proposed at the Amazing Amy party. He never proposed to her there in the book. Um, But they also cut a lot of investigation scenes. So Nick did a lot of like um, going around and questioning people, going to different places and questioning people. He went to the mall and he questioned people. That was actually the cops in this mo- in the movie. He also went to Desi's house and talked to him before he even had contact with her in the casino, you know? So he talked to him and his mom there. He went around all over to talk to people and try to find out where Amy was. And they cut almost all of that out. They also cut out for like a year prior to her disappearance. Amy tried to gain the picture of someone who was like scared and afraid of blood. Like she ha- pretended to pass out while her mother was donating bone marrow. Like she pretended that she was so scared of blood, which was in the in the part where she's setting up the murder scene with the blood. She cuts herself instead of draining herself with an IV. And, you know, they would have never they would have never imagined that she would have done something like that because she was so scared of blood. You know, I think that cutting herself is more believable than doing the weird. IV. The whole, yeah, like that to me doesn't make any sense in the hindsight. But she basically like cut herself and bled on the ground. And that's how she did it. The infamous cool girl speech was partially rewritten for the movie. Where she's saying, you know, men love a cool girl, but cool girls don't exist. Cool girls are just girls who have seen too many movies written by men who have this idea of a woman that they think exists. You know what I mean? This speech defined a lot of, like, a lot of internal, like, fears for women. So I think a lot of people resonated with that speech. I think it was better written in the book. Now, back to Nick's father, where we talked about Don't Fear the Reaper. Nick's father had a much larger role in the book than they did in the movie. Nick talks about in the movie how he's afraid to become like his father and that his father's a misogynist and awful person. And he, like, hates women. And Nick says that he's also in, he's inherited this impulse to hate women. And, like... His father would show up at random places and have, you know, he showed up at the police station, but he showed up consistently throughout the book. And he was always saying, fucking bitch, fucking bitch. I fucking hate that bitch. Like, he was always saying that. And then Nick was also saying that in the book, but he didn't have the the misogyny part in the movie. Like, I mean, he did hate Amy, but he wasn't. It wasn't as pertinent that he had this like weird battle with his father and his misog- his misogyny and his father and all that stuff. I mean, it was obvious that him and his sister hated his dad because he was a dick. But like, there was a lot more to the dad in the book. Amy's parents also played a significantly larger role in the book than they did in the movie. Amy had a very big reason why she used her disappearance to... to hurt her parents too it wasn't only to hurt her husband but it was because her parents had fertility issues and she was she was the child that made it and then they started making amazing amy and as she says in the movie you know i quit violin and then she becomes a a famous violin player right or a prodigy and the other thing that supposedly happened between her and her parents is that her dad used to come in in the book at least come in in the middle of the night and do bad things and I mean, that's I, I original felt that, i felt that coming and that was cut from the movie probably it's a safer thing to not have in the movie obviously yeah. but that is originally how her and desi became to be whatever they were in the beginning 
before Nick, before all the way back in college, is because she confided in Desi and Desi wanted to save her. And that's why he helped her again is because he wanted to save her. The parents, I think, could have played a bigger role in the movie, but you would have had to unleash a lot of trauma from Amy to have to play that, I guess. In the book, there is a scene that is completely cut out of the movie that Nick like breaks up with Andy at his front door and she bites his lip and like pierces into his lip with when she bites him. And that confrontation never takes place. But I thought it was interesting in the book because it kind of showed that Andy had a little bit of like spunk to try to fight for Nick, even though Nick is an awful human being and she probably shouldn't have. In the movie, Nick is like, Amy, I love you. Please come back to us. He gave him all these like clues in this interview saying so that she would come back. And that actually never took place like that. It took place in a bar when he was talking to like a little online blogger who was talking to him in the bar while he was drinking. And he had this grand idea to say these things that she would post them and she would see those things. Again, that never technically happened. And then the relationship with Amy and Desi at the end is Desi is like the the character that I thought was played by was casted com- completely out of left field to be honest. In the audiobook he has an accent and so it makes me think that Desi is like tall, dark and handsome, not Neil Patrick Harris, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um but regardless in the book Amy and Desi spend a lot more time together and she kind of does this in she they have to speed it up obviously in the movie but she becomes like besties with Desi again and they you know they are you know friends again and all of this stuff and she does not kill him in the movie the same way that she kills him in the book she she does have sex with him prior to killing him but then she gives him sleeping pills and then she cut his throat so the all of that like lice in the throat blood on the white sheets and all over her that was all david that came from that man's mind just in case you're wondering Um, and then in the movie amy and nick do this interview with ellen abbott who's you know true crime nancy grace kind of character right Uh, but in the book amy actually writes a memoir and nick writes his own but she says that he's not going to publish it because she's pregnant. It's a whole like publishing memoirs because they're writers. I mean, in the books, they're writers. So instead of doing the television interview, which wrapped it up a little neater, they wrote each other, they wrote memoirs about basically their story. Amy's was basically all false because she was telling her story of being kidnapped by Desi and, and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But Nick's manuscript was titled like, I'm married to a crazy psycho bitch. And like, all of this stuff. Um, And so she says, you're not going to publish that because I'm pregnant and I'm going to make sure that your child knows exactly who you are. You're going to go to jail. You're going to, you know, all of this stuff. And the thing that she had on him was that he poisoned herself with antifreeze and then vomited it up and saved it in a jar. And this was not in the movie at all, but she threatens to use that as evidence. Nick's trying to kill her. And that's why he stays. And that's why he stays to be with his kids. It's not, it wasn't as, like the movie makes it seem like he still loves her and like all this stuff. But like really she's blackmailing him into staying with her because she's going to, she's going to make sure he goes to prison one way or the other for, tr- for attempted murder. I mean, I still, from the movie's ending, I still got the, like he's being forced to stay with her because of the pregnancy. Yeah. Right. And like, yeah, like technically he could still go to jail. Right. But the scene but the scene with Margot was like made it seem like he was trying to admit that he still might have feelings for her. But that was I don't know. That was a little strange to me. And then someone someone said on a podcast about this movie, and I found this on Why the Book Wins website. And it says that the book is about a story of a bad couple and that the movie is a story of a bad person. I feel like the book focuses more of like the two people together as a bad couple 
and the movie focuses more on Amy being a bad person or Nick being a bad person and not them being bad together. And I thought that made sense because I've read both the book and the movie. So, I mean, the book's not going to shock you at all. But if you're interested, you could still read it. There are a lot of things that didn't happen in the movie that happened in the book. So that's all the differences between the book and the movie. Now, I'm going to say personally that I think I liked the book better than the movie. And I feel like we've already talked about this before, is that it's pretty common that if you read the book prior to the movie, you kind of like the movie. Or you kind of like the book more than the movie. So do you want to talk about ratings? Yes. Okay. Would you like me to tell you what they rated, or do you want to rate it first? How about you give me a rating? What do you think? Out of 10. 8.2. 8.2, okay. I would also say an 8. The movie's a pretty good movie. I mean, if you if you just watch it to have fun, you know, mm -hmm. it's a pretty good movie. MDIB rated the movie an 8.1. So you... Are exactly correct. Um, to MDIB. Our trusted tomato boys rated it an 88%, which is an 8.8, .8, which is also very close to 8.2. Yay! And the audience score is an 87%. Bro! Seven, which is almost from what are from the other movies that we've done is unheard of that the that the audience score oh, and the tomato scores are all the same, you yeah. know, on the, around the same. So that's crazy. The book I rated four stars out of five. And on Goodreads, the book is rated 4.1 stars out of five. It's pretty commonly people like the book if they like reading. I mean, if they like to read. The Tomatoes Boys consensus or the critics consensus on the Tomato Boys is it's a dark, intelligent, and stylish to a fault. Gone Girl plays to the director David Fincher's six strengths while bringing the best out of our stars, Ben Affleck and Rosamund Pike. Thank you, Tomato Boys, for your input. I, I mean, okay, so this is one of the most like well-known movies I feel like we've done, other than like classic horror movies that we've done. Like This is like a newer movie, and it's more popular, I feel like, than the movies that we've done. For sure. Don't you think? And so I feel like this is like one of the highest rated movies that we've had. Mm -hmm. uh, considering the amount of people who have rated it and, you know, like it, it's it's one thing if something's rated eight, but it has only like 300 reviews, but it's rated eight and there's like 100,000 reviews. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely think this is one of our most popular and our most highest rated movie that we've watched together. But that's all the fun facts and all the the cool stuff I have about the movie and the book. I did a, a lot of research on this one, and I dedicated a lot of hours to reading and watching the, the movie. Is, the movie is two and a half hours. So if you are not interested in watching a two and a half hour movie, you could probably skip it. It'd be fine. You've already listened to this podcast, so you know all the fun stuff. True. Like and I mean we we basically told you most of it. We we literally told you basically everything, mm -hmm. everything that's important. We told you. Well, thank you, Catherine, for bringing us a triple threat today for our triple digit episode. Yes. So here's to another hundred, Haley. If here's we do it every hundred. single week in a year, one hundred episodes is almost two years, and we have been doing this for two years this month. That's crazy. I know. Isn't that cool? Episodes is two years, basically. But but among the like breaks that we've had and blah blah blah, et cetera, whatever that we've we've done throughout our two years of podcasting, we've gotten a hundred at the end of June. That's cool. I hope you guys enjoyed Gone Girl. Oh, well, it's my turn again next week. So it's True Crime Week next week. So it's our 101 episode. So we might as well just say it's our number one episode. <laughs> just kidding. Oh my gosh. You give us True Crime 101. True Crime 101. Oh my God. <gasps> That's such a good idea. I don't know what I'd teach you though. Like how to get away with murder. We just watched the show. That's eight seasons. That's way too long. All right. Well, 
So, Haley, do you have anything to tell the spooky babes before we let them go? Spooky babes, thanks for joining us this week. Hopefully, you guys did a little self care Saturday. You better have. Yeah, bitch. Anyway, but you know we love you. We care about you, and thanks for sticking by our sides. But we will see y'all next week for true crime, and I'm excited. I don't get too excited. I don't think it's gonna be true crime 101. Yeah, whatever. No, I'm just excited because it's true crime, and I okay. just have to. I just have to sit and listen to story time. Anyway, well, spooky babes. I appreciate you guys. Ow. And I appreciate you, Haley. So, Spooky Babes, remember, you matter. And we are happy that you are here with us. And you are our reason to keep doing this. And so we appreciate you very much. The world's a better place with you in it. And we will see you in your nightmares. Now go be unhinged with someone.